the multitude a rent rights, which burst into the streets of Paris and appeared for the first time in broad daylight, was actually the multitude of the poor and the downtrodden, who every century before had hidden in darkness and in shame. The public realm, which had once been reserved for those who were free, now offered its space and its light to the immense majority who are not free because they are driven by the needs of daily life." End of quote. Now, Hannah Arendt notoriously considered the inexhaustible needs of the poor and their appearance into the light of the public realm as an invasion of bodily necessities into the political realm of freedom. It was under the rule of necessity, she would write, that the multitude rushed to the assistance of the French Revolution, inspired it, drove it onward, and eventually sent it to its doom. Arendt's critics have often returned to these passages in On Revolution to condemn the abstract purity of her concept of the political, her celebration of a public space of appearances that is cleansed of social demands and also of social conflicts. However, buried within Arendt's familiar critique of the so-called social question and all attempts to, in her words, liberate mankind from poverty through political means, was another argument that bears on the topic that I want to talk about tonight, the problem of popular manifestation. For Arendt, the growing demands of the poor over the course of the French Revolution did not only overwhelm and destroy a formerly free space of appearances, as so many of her critics had emphasized. Instead, the social demand helped sustain what she considered a dangerous political fantasy, a fantasy that animated and defined the politics of the French Revolution. That is the fantasy that she saw given clearest articulation, theoretical or philosophical articulation in the work of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and brought to terrible realization in the Jacobin Terror. That is the fantasy that the people can appear and speak as a collective body capable of being incarnated as a unitary presence or as a sovereign will. Here's a rent. What urged the poor on was the quest for bread. And the cry for bread will always be uttered with one voice. Insofar as we all need bread, we are indeed all the same and we may as well unite into one body and act as though possessed by one will." End of quote. So this appearance of the social question in revolutionary France, for her, gave practical support to what would be otherwise easily demystified as a political fantasy. The fantasy of the people, the people as one, a collectivity whose virtuous will could be incarnated and made present in the claims of a revolutionary crowd, or of a popular assembly, or of a revolutionary hero, or even of a single charismatic leader. Robespierre had, after all, likened the people to a sublime ocean to which the great lawgiver had to give form in order to bring to articulation. He had inverted Louis XIV's absolutist dictum, l'état c'est moi, into his own popular authorizing claim. Here's Robespierre's words. I am not the courtier. I am not a moderator, nor the tribune, nor the defender of the people. I am the people myself. So these passages point to the theme that I want to talk about, which is certain pressures or imperatives of collective visibility that characterize episodes of radical democratization whether they occur in the streets of Paris in 1789 or in 1968, or whether they appear more recently in the public squares of Gezi, Tahrir, Zuccotti, or the Porta del Sol. In some of my work, I've described these imperatives of visibility in the terms of the problem of popular manifestation, and it is a problem that is also quite succinctly captured in another famous line of Robespierre's, when he declared before the convention that the people must see themselves assembled in order to feel their power. So I'm a democratic theorist, and that's how I approach these questions. And in recent years, democratic theorists have been preoccupied with this concept, the concept of the people, 
and with the dilemmas or paradoxes that attend appeals to the people's authority in different political contexts. Populism has, for obvious reasons, been a very important concern of this scholarship. So it is a pretty uncontroversial claim to say that the people is nothing but a political construct. It is an imagined community. It does not correspond to any empirical entity or collectivity in the world. And most of us in democratic theory would also agree that the boundary that separates one people off from another can never be morally justified or legitimated through reason or through ratio-critical deliberation. That the boundaries that separate one people from another are therefore always going to be open to ongoing political contestation and renegotiation. This boundary problem, most importantly, cannot be democratically adjudicated. How could it? Democracy cannot deal with this foundational question of democracy, because determining who constitutes the people is an inescapable but a democratically unanswerable dilemma. It is not a question the people can decide, because it is precisely the identity of the people that is up for question. So some political theorists, democratic theorists, simply call this the paradox of democratic politics. You can, you can see it's a kind of formal paradox. It's a chicken and egg paradox. But it is, while being a formal paradox, it can underwrite very deeply contested and sometimes violent forms of political conflict, including secession and civil war. So this paradox of democratic politics is related to what I want to talk about and what I'm focusing on with this question of popular manifestation. The democratic paradox is a problem of law, of legality, of legitimacy, of democratic authority. The problem of popular manifestation might be more accurately characterized as an aesthetic problem because it focuses on how this authorizing entity, the people, publicly appears, how it is made perceptible to the senses, how the people take shape as a collective actor when no formal rules or procedures for identifying popular will exist or when these procedures are so deeply contested as to be effectively deauthorized. So the central question of popular manifestation is not primarily who the people are. It's an important political question, who the people are. But the related question of how the people appear and how the people act. How to image and envision the people and their authorizing will, I want to describe as an aesthetic political problem that haunts modern democracy and democratic theory although it is usually overshadowed by, dem by democratic theory's preoccupations on the principles, the norms, and the procedures for legitimiz legitimizing democratic rule. So pressures of collective visibility. What am I talking about when I talk about these pressures of collective visibility? They're endemic to democratic politics, to any form of politics that is rooted in some notion of collective self-rule by some appeal to what we think of as popular sovereignty. Now, there are many different theoretical frameworks for trying to kind of understand this. There's deconstructive, political, theological, Marxist, psychoanalytic. But rather than getting into these theoretical frames, I think we can be oriented to the basic problem through a simple historical illustration. There's a dramatic shift in the late 18th century, the period of democratic revolutions, say the period between 1776 and 1848, in the West, where the replacement of the rule of the king, personal, external rule, with impersonal and imminent self-rule of the people affects all kinds of transformations in how political institutions are organized, how you imagine the legitimation of law. There are representational difficulties that accompany this basic shift. But there are also difficulties of visualization and of form. Think about it this way. The sovereignty of a king, the so royal sovereignty, the divine right of kings, all of these kind of antiquated discourses of legitimacy that we associate with a pre-democratic age, they were powerful mythologies of, of, of legitimation. But the sovereignty of the people you can think of as even a more fictive, you might even say more 
complicated fiction than the divine right of kings. A king may seem dubious in his divinity, but he didn't have to be imagined, right? He was a visible presence wearing his crown and carrying his scepter, but the people are never visible as such. So where do you look to the source of this newfound democratic legitimation? So there is a need, and there is also an impossibility of bringing the sovereign people to, percep per to perceptibility, to tangibility. And this establishes certain very important but indeterminate, indeterminate conditions of democratic politics. The invisibility of the collective sovereign engenders pressures to bring this collectivity into sensible presence, to give it form, to render it tangible to the senses. We know that as democracy emerges, it emerges alongside some very characteristic democratic norms like transparency, publicity, right? disenchantment. So democratic theorists have very rarely paid attention to these pressures of visibility. And when they have, like a rent, they have almost always characterized them as political pathologies or perversions. So in the last part of this talk, I want to talk about two very important contemporary French, relatively contemporary French, theorists who have wrestled with this problem, Claude Lefort and Pierre Rosenballon. Claude Lefort was the most influential theorist of this problem. Lefort is well known for approaching the political as a symbolic domain through which a society represents its unity and its political collectivity to itself. So Lefort in his writings followed theories of the king's two bodies, medieval theories of the king's two bodies, and argued that in this pre-modern or med medieval context, the doubling of the body of the king served as a kind of necessary mediation between the visible realm of worldly power, right, political conflicts in the world given to our experience, and an invisible realm of transcendental absolutes. The king's body united society within his personhood and under his rule. It projected unity onto society. It gave society an orderly body politic in such a way that political power social hierarchies and distinctions were perceived to have a natural and a theological basis. This is what is completely undone by the democratic revolutions, exemplified for him by revolutionary France. The democratic re revolutions destroy this symbolic unity and its transcendental anchoring, most obviously by cutting off the head of the king, by physically destroying the king's body. So this leads Lefort to define political modernity itself, the democracy of political modernity, with what he calls the disincorporation of the political. The political is about disembodiment. It's no longer anchored in the authority of a particular person. When a society can no longer be represented as a body and is no longer embodied in the figure of the prince, Lefort writes, it is time that the people becomes the major pole and social identity. But that community remains forever undefinable, forever latent. So Lefort has a very famous proclamation in his work that people that read him this often return to this basic idea, that in democracy, the locus of power is an empty place. Right? There is an empty place which engenders the historical adventure of democratic politics, constantly trying to fill it, never incarnating it fully, continually questioning and contesting what counts as ultimate political legitimacy. Now for Lefort and many who followed in his lead, the logic of incorporation does not disappear entirely from democracy. It remains present as a constant threat that lurks within democratic politics. Democracy engenders something like what I'm calling this pressure of collective visibility. But Lefort understands it in purely pathological terms. How do we extract the capital P people, that is, the people of the image of one, a complete and unitary subject, aside apart from the mass aggregate of individuals? This is an internal threat to democracy that Lefort and his followers associate with certain dangers of populism, but also with terror, right? Because what is the terror 
do. In Lafour's reading of the French Revolution, the motive of the terror is not to a particular instrumental means that the people newly enthroned as powerful used to destroy their enemies. It is how they come to appear as the people. The terror also provides certain visible evidence of a society that is at one with itself. So think of an example. So one of the most famous proclamations of Robespierre during the revolution was that the king must die so that the nation must live. Right? The king must die so that the nation must live. Well, on the four's reading, this is fully revealed ultimately in the purge of enemies. Because that purge is motivated by the desire to furnish proof of the reality of the people enthroned and empowered by the revolution. Now, Pierre Rosenvallon, who's a student of Lafour's, has also taken up this kind of idea of these pressures of visibility, but he's applied them to the, the politics of popular crowd insurrections and assemblies and tried to see the way, so not just in the tear, like the tear itself can provide evidence of the people by producing the body of its enemies, right? It materializes the boundary between the people that have been enthroned and the enemies that threaten the people and the revolution. Rosa Malone has applied this to the politics of crowds and insurrection in a very revealing way. Through these examples, he sees the concept of the people struggling to incarnate itself in the revolutionary and post-revolutionary years. So for both Rosa Malone and for Lafour, and this is where I want to be kind of critical of them, these imperatives or pressures of collective visibility, of collective manifestation are seen as wholly pathological pressures that have to be somehow overcome. We should be comfortable in sustaining the gap in the space of power in democracy. In Rosa Malone, there's a fundamental gap between the unitary vision of the people, the nation as a whole, and the fact that that unitary vision will never be adequately represented. There will always be a failure. There will always be some kind of obfuscation, something that falls outside of representation. For Lafour, the tear is how the manifestation to fully fill that space with, of power with another corporal entity results. That's the result. For Rosenbalon, even the politics of insurrection and crowds, people at the barricades, popular assemblies, are manifestations of this dangerous tendency that keeps us in a kind of, in his mind, a kind of political immaturity. So the visibility of the people as an actor, he can write, whether in the tumult of the street or in the good behavior of pa patriotic festivals, allows the people the possibility of postponing the difficulties that always come with forms of popular representation. It kind of keeps us naive, it keeps us invested in romantic ideas of the people fully coming to take power. Contemporary critics of populism often find the, the theoretical core of that dangerous populist tendency in these kinds of arguments. So let me wrap up. I think there's a lot to engage with and to debate in this central argument that the temptation of collective incorporation moves invariably in the direction of terror or leads us to some kind of political naive, naivete in the people's power to kind of take authority and act collectively on their own behalf. Both Lafour and Rosenbalone offer a very compelling account of how that temptation emerges as a problem from within democratic politics in its history. I mean, Rosenbalone is really much more of a historian than he is a political philosopher. So crowds and popular assemblies are only one area of concern for this problem of popular manifestation during episodes of radical democratization, whether it be revolutionary episodes at the end of the 18th century or contemporary forms of popular politics today. But they are a particularly important one for anybody who is interested in the emergence of popular sovereignty and the dilemmas that it posed and continues to pose for understanding the potentials of radical democratic politics today. We have to stop thinking, I think this history teaches us, 
of the people as only and forever a legally constituted electorate on the one hand and a quasi-mystical fetish on the other. The problem with Lafour and Rosenbalone, as I understand it, is that they translate what I want to think of as these aesthetic problems of collective manifestation that accompany popular sovereignty and democratic forms of collective self-rule into something like a political theology of incarnation. They only see violent and exclusionary closure of the collective subject. And they do not see how it also appears as a catalyst to the emergence of new and pluralized forms of democratic collectivity. So lurking within our prevailing quantitative conceptions of peoplehood, the people as a numerical electorate whose legibility is framed only through the tallying of votes, is another collectivity historically forever contested, and it always resists these metrics. The people as a popular manifestation has been a continually reiterated part of democracy's past. Every step in these, four, in these moments of radical egalitarian democratization have had, have had encounters with something like this dilemma of collective visibility. So it's always been a part of democracy's past, and I think that it also remains a continual source of rejuvenation for any way in which we can envision a possibility for different democratic futures. That's where I want to end. Thanks.